Hi everyone, my name is Allison Hawkins. I'm the Assistant Director of the Boston Consortium for Arab Region Studies and I graduated from Fletcher in 2017. Uh, today I'm here with my colleague and my friend Ruby Assad who's joining us from Amman, Jordan. Hi Ruby. Hi. Hi Allison. Hi, can you introduce yourself really quickly for everyone here? Of course. Um, I'm Ruby Assad. I'm agriculture engineer. Uh, I'm specialized in community engagement and uh, community participation, community cohesion and resilience. I worked uh, with public sector, private sector, international donors, projects in Jordan, outside Jordan, in Yemen, in Syria, in Egypt, in uh, Lebanon, in Palestine. And um, I worked with refugees, particularly with Syrian refugees as well. Yes, and that's actually how Ruby and I initially met. Uh, we worked together throughout 2017 and 2018 to research and write the Refugees in Towns report focused on Amman. Uh, for our presentation today, we'd just like to share a few key points from the report. And our PowerPoint slides will highlight directly some of the experiences um, conveyed by our interlocutors. And we're also going to talk about what has changed in Amman over the years with regards to refugee integration in the city, as well as how that has been impacted by COVID-19. So looking back to the report and considering uh, the evolution of refugee integration since, since we wrote it, uh, Ruby, can you share some, some positive things that you think are happening in Amman regarding refugee integration? Of course. Alison, you know that uh, uh, we have long history with refugees uh, integration here in Jordan. And uh, it started, uh, to my knowledge, from uh, 1948, the Palestinian refugees, uh, 1967, and then, um, you know, with the Lebanese crisis in the 80s, then with Kuwait, Iraq uh, crisis, and we had uh, people coming from Kuwait, and then with Syrian refugees and the Syrian uh, crisis now. So we have, like, um, um, a long history um, of refugees. And we have also in Jordan uh, long established NGOs um, that are working particularly in Amman, but also in the governorate. And um, they are doing well combating the host community versus refugees um, uh, narrative. Um, you know, like the, um, some initiatives um, for um, low income Jordanian that uh, help people and uh, refugees in hosting them in their houses and offering them food, offering them blankets and, and uh, heaters in, in cold uh, season. So, um, and, and for the government as well, that they help the refugees and they, um, um, in an informal way, not only formally, but informal as well. Because, you know, for example, like uh, uh, Syrian people, if they want to work, work in Jordan, they should have a work permit. At certain time, even um, just turning the blind eye and they were working and, um, you know, not uh, captured or uh, be under the spot. So um, um, we have a history, long history with refugees, uh, Alison, here in Jordan. Yes, yes. Thank you for those points. Um, however, we know that integration, you know, how it's defined and how people experience it is still very challenging, particularly because, you know, as you brought up, there are many Jordanians in the capital are also struggling and there can be um, this kind of sense of competition between Jordanians and non-Jordanians, uh, different refugee communities, because there's limited resources to support everyone at the same time. So with that in mind, can you maybe talk about where are the gaps and what are some of the key struggles facing the city as refugees continue to stay and live there over a protracted period of time? Um, as you know, Alison, you might know that Jordan is a small country with limited resources. So having refugees really overburdened uh, public services, I mean, healthcare, education, uh, transportation, water resources, all of that, and um, um, even the, the lifestyle, I mean, um, uh, access to affordable housing, 
um, it's a huge issue. Some people, they believe or we believe that um, due to refugees, we have a high cost of living in general. Um, uh, they led to higher prices. You know that they are supported, financially supported uh, by the UNHCR and they have um, uh, certain financial allowance and so for that they can go for high rent amount, for example. So uh, house renting getting high. So I believe they, they affected uh, uh, Jordan in some way. Yes, and you know some of what you described, these, the high cost of living, access to livelihoods, things like that, those are long-term challenges, right? And they will require kind of long-term thinking and long-term solutions. Um, but like you said, the, these aren't issues that are being ignored. There's a willingness from the Jordanian government and NGOs to tackle at least some of these issues or at least attempt to. Um, so, but one of the things that we are, of course, concerned about as researchers is, you know, is all of this research that we're conducting, uh, the Refugees in Towns Project, different initiatives from universities and international NGOs. Is that research then being used by the government, being used by NGOs to help find solutions to some of these problems that you're talking about? What do you think? Um, yeah. The, those researches uh, really help uh, both NGOs, government, uh, um, you know, that those researches normally, even if have been developed by universities or international donors or by the government, it would be on participatory approach in cooperation with NGOs or community representatives and all of that. So the NGOs development of those reports through the NGOs, it's this process by itself a kind of, you know, on-job training for NGOs. So they can learn more about uh, uh, the refugees and about the uh, findings and recommendations of those reports. Um, on the other hand, the government as well, you know, like some of findings for better integration and for uh, the integration to, to uh, reach the integration between those re refugees and locals, it was uh, decided to go for activities targeting, targeted activities through projects uh, to target the community, local communities as well, like the uh, experience that I have with the GRZ uh, working in water program, uh, providing vocational training, it was targeting both Jordanian and refugees. But I believe that there should be more like awareness raising activities uh, toward the uh, reports, recommendations, and findings, uh, not only to the uh, local people, but also for decision makers. And there should be like for NGOs as well, um, a kind of more uh, to focus about the um, um, cohesion aspect relationship between communities, all of that, it should be, um, you know, um, informing the decision makers and NGOs to uh, inform them about the findings and at the same time, those researchers to focus on relationship between communities. Yes, I think that's really important and something that a lot of the people we spoke with when we were interviewing uh, refugees and Jordanians for the report that they also mentioned as well. So I think it's really important to highlight here. Um, but you know, as we discussed, it's been a couple years since we conducted this field work and since we wrote the report. So I'm really curious to bring this conversation kind of into the present and talk about what is happening in Amman right now um, since the onset of COVID-19 in relation to refugee integration. Um, I know at least from watching from the US, uh, it seemed like Jordan was pretty organized and had a very effective response to the pandemic, at least at the beginning. Um, but I'm wondering if you can talk a bit about what you've seen happen in the city since March and how the pandemic has affected both Jordanian and refugee communities. What do you think the impact has been on refugee integration and community cohesion, for example? Yeah. Actually, COVID-19 is affecting everybody. I, I believe the whole universe and particularly in Jordan, everybody. So um, uh, the government was taking care of everybody. Uh, no differentiation between Jordanian and non-Jordanian. Um, for example, you know, like um, at, at the beginning, some shops uh, started to raise the prices. So the government interfered immediately and they were uh, ready to help everybody. Any complaint coming from anybody, the government was taking it into consideration uh, effectively. 
uh, for education, for example, you know that we turned into um, online training and uh, on, sorry, online education. And uh, um, so this was available for everybody, Jordanian, non-Jordanian, the Syri Syrian refugees also had access, um, but it might be like, you know, um, um, the internet problem, access to internet, but mm -hmm. this is for everybody. It wasn't only for certain group or for refugees and available for Jordanian. No, it was a problem for everybody. So no real um, uh, differentiation in treating um, uh, communities and uh, refugees by the government. Uh, for example, um, at the beginning of the crisis, there were a curfew and the uh, government decided to distribute bread uh, on all households. So bread was distributed on everybody, everyone, um, not uh, only Jordanian. Uh, so, um, the government is considering human issue as a top priority and uh, they work on uh, protecting humanity with no uh, um, limit. I mean, nothing can limit uh, uh, government health, uh, nor uh, religion, national origin, age whatsoever. It was for everybody. So, I believe COVID is affecting everybody and affected, uh, I think, Jordanian and non-Jordanian, everybody. Yeah, I think, you know, some of the problems you're highlighting, like access to livelihoods and issues with education and distance learning, um, the, those are things that a lot of people all around the world are struggling with. And you're right to point out that it impacts different communities across Amman, but perhaps in slightly different ways. So. I just exactly. want to bring it back and say thank you so much, Ruby, for all of these valuable insights about what's happening in the city right now. And I think that if anything, the report and our discussion here highlights that refugee integration is an issue that Aman is continually and repeatedly confronting over the years. And just what that means and how it looks will continue to evolve and take different shapes as well. So. I'm really looking forward to our discussion with everyone at the conference and to hearing everyone's perspectives and reactions to some of Ruby's points. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Alison. Thank you.